Hello, welcome to Biology Classroom. And this is Ms. Shekufe. I'm Shekufe, your biology teacher for IGCSE with the uh, 0610. I'm going to discuss this question paper that I have made here. And let's get started. The first question of this question paper is about the breathing mechanism, as you can see there from the diagram. So we read together first. As I told you, in the exam, I know that to manage your time, you first have to read the question and see what it is, if you can answer without reading those extra information at the beginning or those storytellings, just skip those parts and just go straight to the question and answer it. But if you think you need more data, more information, and more a help so you have to first go back into the initial part and read everything step by step to see what are those data which is given to you and you can use it to answer the question properly so but here i want to read this one properly for you so i will explain step by step what this is because you will find definitely these answers uh, answering the scheme on the online so but Sometimes the students just by looking at the answer scheme, they won't know why the answer is this. So you should know the reason behind it. So that's what we are doing. The gas exchange system is one of the organ system of the human body. And figure one one shows, always make sure that you match the figure number and do the question with the uh, right figure. So you use the right figure. Sometimes students, if they just look into the wrong figures because sometimes if there are more figures in one question, you may, without looking at the figure number, you may do a very big mistake. So your if you look at the figure one, one shows part of the gas exchange system during breathing in and out. So complete the table, what, what is asking from you here? You read the question properly, what is asked from you? Complete the table. One, one. What is table one, one? Is this one. So, to show the functions of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles during breathing in and breathing out, the pressure changes in the thorax and use the words below contract, relax, increases, and decreases. Sometimes, so in order to answer this question, you should know what are these terminologies. You have to refer to the notes that already I have shared, or just I explain again one more time here. You look at your chest actually, and I know it acts. There is a diagram here that can help you if you have forgotten. When you breathe in, what should actually happen? The chest should be in a, in a position, and also the lungs, that they can take as much as air as it can. So it, can, it should expand. For expansions of the lungs, the ribs should move outward and down, isn't it? So it should open to give that flexibility to let the lungs to move. And also, there is one other ear organ, diaphragm, that is a kind of like muscle and is here located on the, is below the uh, lungs on the beneath the lungs so what is happening here if the diaphragm during this uh, breathing in it means that we're sending air uh, inside the lungs so we need more space if the diaphragm is like this i mean if it is like a dome and is is bringing pressure on the lungs so Actually, it makes the lungs to be under the pressure and also less space they will have. So in order to allow to open up more, give more space to the lungs to expand, the diaphragm should actually a little bit become straight and move down. When the diaphragm is straight, it means it is contracted. So in a, in a contracted state, the diaphragm looks like in a straight line. So it means that it is contracting to form in a way, to shape it actually in a way that the lungs can move a little bit and expand. So the air can actually can kind of take more air inside. So the diaphragm should move down and become like a straight line. 
So we call this as the diaphragm is contracted. But in a relaxed form, that what is happening to the diaphragm. So it becomes actually curved, more curved upward. So it's squeezing the lung, pressing it, and pushing the air out of it. Exactly. See, so that is important. So the diaphragm cannot be when you are breathing in because the lung expands. They need more space for the air. So this cannot be the shape of the diaphragm. They should move out, I mean, down to become more straight line like this. Okay, so, so we learned that diaphragm, when it is in a, in a uh, relaxed actually status, looks like a dome like this. It's just curved upward to apply more pressure on the lungs. And when in a, in a way, when it is contracted, it moves down and become more like a straight line. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that we're looking at the ribs first. Um, what is happening to the ribs? These are ribs. We have actually 12 ribs, but the two of them, they are not connected at the base and the ear. So that's why they are not counted. They are not actually presented here. Um, these ribs, they got in muscles between them, as you can see. One of the sets of the muscles are internal. It means that they are inside of the ribs. They connect the ribs from inner part, inner side. And the other ones, as you can see, they are located in the outside. They connect the ribs from the outer part. I mean, they are located outside of the ribs. So, in when you are breathing in, when you breathe in, the internal intercostal muscles, the ones that are inside, um, first, they, they are, should be relaxed. So this is the job of the external intercostal muscles to actually contract, to contract, become shorter, and to pull actually the uh, ribs outward. Like this, it's like pressing the ribs toward to each other, so they expand and they give more space to the chest. I mean, the chest has more space now, and the lock can expand even further. So there is so in the breathing in or inhalation of the air. So we have relaxation of the intercostal muscles, in internal intercostal muscles. And we have contractions of the or shortening of the muscles uh, in the, coast, in the inter external intercostal muscles. The ones that are outside, they shorten and become contracted. The one inside, they stay relaxed. But when it comes to breathing out, exhalation, the internal mu mus uh, intercostal muscles, the internal ones, they contract, they become shortened. So once they become shorter, their ribs actually press the lungs. They can press the chest also, uh, the chest cavities. It's pressed against the uh, lungs to push the air out. And also the external one this time is relaxed. So they like antagonistic. I mean, they work opposite. So once is one relaxed, the other one is contracted. So you have to know which one is contracted. So the other one would be relaxed. Now, what is the thorax? The thorax actually is that your chest area, that, that part is called as a thorax. And we want to know about the pressure and of the air there. When you want to breathe in, based on these rules that you know, always air uh, molecules, they, vary from, they move from where they are more to where they are less. I mean, draw high pressure to lower pressure. That's how the, what the air molecules they move. So if there should be a condition inside the lungs and your chest or the thorax, should be somehow that the pressure inside it is much more lower compared to the outside, uh, you mean outside area, outside of your body. So the outside pressure should be in, when in the inhalation, usually should be um, 
uh, usually should be more, the outside should be more, and the inside should be less. So that's why it causes the air to move inside your lung. So by these kind of things, when the chest opens up and it moves outward and down, and also lungs the same, and the airfrag actually it becomes con con uh, it becomes um, uh, contracted, so become like a straight line. Uh, let the open up or stay a space for the lungs to move. Uh, it causes the air to flow in, to rush inside your chest, inside your lungs. So in inhalation, the pressure outside of the body is much more higher than the thorax pressure. So pressure in the thorax should be low. That's why the air moves in. But in the breathing out, so we need to set the air needs to go out some high pressure always to low so the pressure inside the lungs should be increased should be more compared to the outside if the pressure in the of the thorax should be in the chest should be much more higher than the pressure outside of your body that's why the, the air molecules they move they were pushed out okay so now by knowing this now you can fill up this table. So again, diaphragm, when you breathe in, diaphragm contracts when you breathe in. But when you breathe out, it relaxes. Intercostal muscles, internal, the, in the breathing in, this should be relaxed. When you breathe out, this should be contracted. External muscles, External intercostal muscles, when you breathe in, they are contracted, and when you breathe out, they are relaxed. How does the pressure change in the thorax? The pressure change in the thorax, when you breathe in, it decreases, and when you breathe out, it increases, as I told, because in breathing out, air should move from the high pressure to low pressure. So in the chest or the thorax, it should be more than outside. So you just write increase, and for breathing in, it should be decrease. That's about how you sort them inside the table, these words. Some of them, the baby can be repeated more than once. So if you have done this, you got four marks already. We move on to the next part of this question. By just looking at it, I know that this is alveolus is a gas exchange sac, is where the gas exchange happens. This is a very big diagram of it. So it is 350 times bigger than what actually it normally is, the real, the real life size. So the real life size is very small, it's tiny, but it is magnified 350 times bigger. Now, State the features of the gas exchange surface that are visible in the figure. The, I always when I'm asking students about, uh, they are confused by this, that what, are, what do they mean by uh, features? I might make it like bigger so we can see. Okay, the question. What do we mean by the features? The features means that traits that characteristics that outer from the out, on, uh, outward uh, features whatever you see and outside or whatever you see they are observable uh, can be seen so you just look at it and what are those things that you see which is actually defined and makes it special for the gas exchange this kind of the tissue or okay in every every part in the tissue on this for example uh, organ um, you look at these parts. Um, first of all, I look at the general feature of it. It is like a sack, it's like a bag. Is I can say it is sack-like or sack-shaped uh, a structure. Um, and also, you look at the walls of it. They are quite thin. They are quite thin, so they allow the fast diffusion of the gases, a better gas exchange. And to all blood vessels or network of the blood vessels, I mean the capillaries around it. 
and you can see. So it allows uh, the better contact and very close contact of the blood and also uh, the air together. They are not directly in contact, but the capillaries are having only very thin wall. And also the alveolus has a very thin wall and it lets the gases to be diffused in and out of them, um, the gas exchange, be exchanged between them quickly and more efficiently. So there are the different features that you can mention. So first of all, the general or overall shape of it, which is sac-like structure. And the other one is it having a thin wall and the other one is a network of the blood of the blood cells or capillaries. For C of this question, the cell label acts on the figure from a tissue, define the term tissue. It has nothing to do with the eggs. It has nothing just asking you to define or explain what the tissue, generally this terminology means. Tissue are usually a group of the similar cells. They have a similar structure, I mean. And they function together as a unit to perform a job, a similar job similar for the same role they have. So there are a group of the similar cells, they function together as a unit to do same job. So you have mentioned all because you always look at the marks, how many marks is given to it too. At least you have to mention two important uh, points about this uh, tissue when you're explaining it, when you're defining it. Cartilage is another tissue found in the gas exchange system. State the functions of the cartilage in the gas exchange system. So what are these? Actually, I told you in the cartilage all can be found everywhere from the trachea, from bronchi, and but the alveolus doesn't have only. The alveolus, the air sacs, they don't have cartilages. There are similar hard structures that are quite rigid. You can see that they are actually in the trachea, they are like a half ring. So it's not a complete ring. It's not like a circle around your trachea. It's like a half, it's like a C shape. So behind it, it is actually doesn't have any cartilage. And it gives the flexibility to the trachea at the same time. Uh, two, actually, because behind there is a esophagus that the food actually uh, moves into it. So it should give way to the food to easily to pass through the esophagus. So uh, so doesn't actually uh, interfere with that uh, eating process. And the, when the, movie, the foods are, uh, pieces of the food are moving inside the esophagus, it just it's quite flexible, it changes its shape a bit. So, but at the other part, it has a ring of the, uh, these kind of cartilages around. It is uh, most of the parts of this gas exchange system is except alveolus, because it actually keeps the tra tra trachea open to let actually the air uh, pass through it easily. And doesn't let it to collapse or uh, or also over expanding of the uh, this trachea or of the things when you're all gasping. And also, um, yeah, that is very important. So it keeps the trachea open and holds it in, in the place, doesn't let it to collapse or doesn't let it to over expand. And at the same time, let the esophagus also to uh, the move, move inside the esophagus easily. Um, so these are the answers for this. You can write any two points and you can get the whole mark because you only have two marks. So if you only choose one of these answers that, for example, it holds the shape of it, um, doesn't let it to collapse, or you just write that it allows the food to pass through esophagus easily because it's a C shape, it's not a complete ring of the cartilage, and that's it. Question number two is about the digestion and the nutrient of the nutrients. Biological washing powders contain enzymes that break down food stains. Complete the table below 2.1, which is 2.1. Look at it, it always should be matched with this one. 
If it is not, you have to find that respective table. By naming the enzyme that break down three substances in food stains and by uh, stating the product or products. So we have a substance yeah, or the molecules here, yeah, starch molecule, fat molecule, and protein. You need to find the enzyme that digests these substances because you know the enzymes are quite specific. Each of these substances enzyme can only uh, catalyze one of the substances, cannot break down one of the substances that are quite spe uh, specific. And the products that are formed, what are they? If they are breaking, if the starch is broken down, it is, should be broken down into what is its component is in it, what is it been made of, the subunits of it, its monomers. So we should know that. For you, at this level, it's better to know that the starch is a kind of sugar molecule, which is made of two, which is usually uh, is a bit, a very insoluble and is very complex molecule of the sugar. The enzyme that, that the first step into the first initial digestion of the starch happens in the mouth, and because the mouth has amylase, which is an enzyme uh, for digestion of the starch uh, in the saliva, which is produced by the salivary glands. So it is excreted and uh, it works on the starch grains in the uh, food actually that you have taken and it breaks down the starch into maltose, which is uh, another sugar molecule, but it is much more simpler than the starch. And the maltose itself is made of two glucose molecules. Glucose molecules are the simplest uh, forms of the sugars. Very easy to be absorbed or taken into the, uh, be absorbed in, or diffused inside into the uh, bloodstream. So that's the final product, but for the time being, in the mouth, amylase breaks down the starch into maltose. So the answer is enzyme is amylase. Everything ends at ASE. It means that it's an enzyme, amylase. So it is broken down into maltose molecules. Now, further on, later on, it goes into the intestine. And in the small intestine, there is another enzyme that can break down maltose molecules into uh, smaller sugar glucose molecules. Because maltose is made of two glucose molecules joined together. So maltase is an enzyme later in the small intestine that can break maltose into two glucose molecules. So the, that's the final digestion of the uh, starch molecule that happens in the small intestine. So about the fat molecules, fat molecule is made up of a glycerol plus two fatty acid molecules. If I want to show the structure of the fat, of one, for example, the fat molecule, that is how I can uh, do that for you or just uh, share a diagram with you. For example, this is a fat molecule. It has a rounded shape head. And then it has two tails or three tails, it depends. But all of them are these fat molecules. This is one molecule of the fat. And it is consisted of two, these two parts. This part is named as a glycerol. I can just type the name for you here. It is called as glycerol. And this head part, this part of it. Is glycerol. And these two tails, these two, they are called fatty acids. So they are, when they are joined together, they make one whole molecule. This is one molecule of fat, or cholesterol, fat. Okay. So if one to dive, if for order to uh, send this fat molecule in, into the bloodstream, so it can reach, be reached to the cells to be used as a source of the energy or food, they need to be digested first in the elementary canal and by enzymes, and then become very small. Uh, actually, it is broken down into its small subunits 
And what is it made of which is fatty acid and glycerol that it can be absorbed into through the wall of the inter, uh, small intestine and it can go into your bloodstream and then be carried out and carried into the every individual cell that it needs fat actually uh, nutrients so now that enzyme that can break uh, up fat actually molecules is called as because the fat is called as a light uh, light lipid so we can call it as a lipase again ase it comes from the lipid molecule which is fat so it comes as a lipase is an enzyme that breaks the fat into its components so which is called as a they got out the components it means that it should be broken out into if i draw this one again so we will have one glycerol now this is broken down it is not connected anymore plus what is the other one the other one should be two fatty acid tails so this is what we have so these are the products of the uh, digestion uh, of this enzyme lipase of the uh, which digests the fats into glycerol and fatty acids so i hope this helps to shape now so fat lipase is the enzyme and the products are fatty acids and glycerol. How about protein? Protein are made up of amino acid molecules, different types of the amino acid molecules. So they join together, they combine, and they make different protein molecules. So the enzyme that digests protein, they are, this is called as a protease, and, and also breaks down the protein into amino acids. What are the products are amino acids. So if you have filled up all this paper, so you will get the full mark. Now, the next part, I think, you know, is to make a comparison. Is a comparison by looking at the a graph, which is two-line graph. You have to know how to interpret it, how to interpret the data, how to analyze it. So first of all, I read these questions. Uh, I, can, I can buy the time just by skipping this part. Yeah, they are actually giving some information to me, but I can first look at this graph and to see if I can, without wasting time reading that, can I just write anything about it? So by looking at this graph, I have this information. First of all, there are the keys given to me that this uh, continuous line is a non-biological washing powder, and which is compared with the, this actually broken line biological washing powder. I mean, the broken line represents the biological washing powder and on the y, in the y-axis is showing the percentage of the light reflected after washing and also uh, this one uh, shows on the x-axis we have temperature of the washing uh, in the unit also is in celsius or centigrade degrees we have two lines as you can see here and but just want to know about this reflection of the light compared to how effective biological, not biological washing powders are at removing the stains at different temperatures, okay, 10 and 60, and uh, pieces of stained cloth were washed, and then, okay, the degree of the stain removal was measured by using a light meter, okay? So the light meter to record the percentage of the light reflected from the cloth, and a light meter gave a value of 100% when the cloth was completely clean, it means that the higher, the higher the percentage, it means that the better, the better and more if, if effective the washing uh, actually powder is into cleaning uh, the cloths. So it means the higher values, higher percentages here shows that these more effective the washing powder is. So this is what I wanted to know about these things. So it means that the higher the value here, otherwise the better and more effective it is in cleaning. Now I can write my uh, interpretation about this, actually what I see. The first of all, when you have two line graph, first of all, look for similarities, any similarities in the lines and make general statements. For example, like both lines are increasing or decreasing or both. You see what they, do they have in common? What are similar in both of these two, generally? And then look for the differences. Look at the differences, for example, uh, 
look at the start point and the end points, look at compare the steepness of the lines and the change over points and see at which points both uh, in these two graphs they are changing and what are the differences between them um, and then getting lower or higher. And also look at the constant phases and see what are the difference between these two lines uh, uh, regarding the constant phases when they are, uh, there is no change by changing the temperature in the effectiveness of them. And see which one has or which one uh, has actually that kind of the things or which one happens earlier. See in which of them, for example, the uh, that maximum, for example, effectiveness happens earlier or reaches to that maximum effectiveness or which one, for example, reaches to the constant phase, for example, earlier or later. There are all the differences that you have to mention. And then compare the, peck, the peaks or lower points and also compare the highest or lowest values. These are what you can do when you want to construct your own sentences and write your comparison to, uh, to compare these two. So the times that each one reaches the, its peak also is very important. You can use this one to see which one reaches to the peak earlier or quicker to the guard at which time. You can, you can mention the times, for example, between this time or that one, you can this temperature or that temperature, this one, for example, uh, or you can this one reaches to the peaks or having the peaks faster, quicker than the other one. Uh, you can compare also the ranges between them. You see, uh, for example, in this enzyme or this, for example, washing powder, uh, it works on the quiet, um, wide range of the, for example, temperatures, while the other one only works in the very uh, small ranges of the temperature it can uh, work in. So for this one, what you have to write, you can look at this graph. I just make it a little bit down. Okay. So for example here, the general one is that, for example, these uh, biological uh, is more effective uh, effective at the lower temperatures, as you can see, compared to the other one. The other non-biological is more effective at the higher temperatures in cleaning the uh, deaths from the clouds. You can see that this is, works better in the lower temperatures, and the other one, which is uh, non-biological, works better in the, high, in the higher temperatures. And you can mention the temperatures too, also, you can say, for example, this is 40, 50, so 41, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So each one box equals to one uh, Celsius. So it means that if it is higher still here, it means that, I just walk in to see. So this one works the best for example, the biological one in the lower temperature, ranging from 10, for example, to uh, 40, something like that, 40 cent uh, centigrade degrees or Celsius. And the other one works better in the more effective in the higher temperature, for example, starting from uh, 45 to 60 Celsius. Um, and also another comparison that I can make, for example, I can say that uh, they have similar trends from 10 to 30 uh, Celsius and also between 50 and 60, between 50 and 60 Celsius, they both have similar effect. You can see both of them at the same time are increasing. So the lines, shapes of both of them are in an increasing and ascending form. The other thing that I can say, mention here, I can say that these, uh, the highest point or the lowest point, okay, for the biological one is more best effective at this range, for example, at this point, which is between 30 and 40. Between 30 and 40, Celsius is the best, the best effective. 
But for the non-biological, it may take longer and needs higher temperature to become more effective. So the most effectiveness for the non-biological is obtained after 60 Celsius. Another, I mean, you can write a lot of comparisons. Another one, for example, you can see the lowest point here. There is a drop here. There is a decrease in the effectivity of the biological uh, washing powder again. So at this temperature, it should be a 44 Celsius. At 44 Celsius, or we can see even a range between 40 and 44 Celsius, there is a drop or decrease in the effectiveness of the biological washing process. So we can see there is a fluctuation. So this is how you interpret and you write about the graph if there are two lines and you want to compare, these are the things, the things that you, the steps that you have to go through. So at least you have to write four points here to get four marks. Each of your points will be given one mark. So uh, I have given a lot of answers perhaps. So you can choose any. If you don't have anything to write, sometimes you can just use the data, give a, give a value or do some subtract and give a range or give a percentage or something like that. You can do some calculations to, to answer these kind of questions. So we go to the next question now. And uh, in the next question, the students suggested that the enzymes in the biological washing powder were denatured at high temperatures. Explain why enzyme molecules do not function when they are denatured. You know that the enzymes are made of the proteins and also they have an active side made of, that it has a very spe specific special uh, shape and form. So and it is kind. It is each active site of the each enzyme is a specific and as complementary to only one specific substrate. So once this shape change changes, the enzyme and the substrate, the substrate won't be able to have successful collisions. They cannot be fitted into each other. They, they won't be any kind of a reaction happening there. So what changes this shape of the active site? It can be temperature, it can be pH, and it changes in these two factors can highly affect the shape of the active site of the enzyme and it causes the enzyme to become denatured or not to work anymore. So it won't be any success. So this is the answer that you can give to this part of the questions. So first of all, the heat or the uh, pH changes in them. They can change the shape of the active site of the proteins, which is enzyme here. And then it causes the substrate and enzyme to do not actually uh, be able to have any successful uh, collision together. So it means that the enzyme will be denatured. The next part, the next question is forensic scientists often try to find DNA on items of the stain clothing. The DNA can be used to identify individual people and suggest why DNA can be used to identify individual people. Because DNA, you know that it's made of the, the sequences of the bases and these a unique sequence of the bases and amino acids in the DNA, uh, which is very uh, special and unique for each of the individuals. And even the two twins they may not share even the same similar base sequences in the DNA. So it is a very good way to find uh, and to identify the different people. It's like your fingertips, uh, the, the patterns on your fingertips is not similar in any any people uh, that do similar people even. So they do not share the same finger finger patterns. So that is, looks like that one is quite unique at each individual uh, people. These kind of the base sequences. This is the answer. Thank you. And now I turn into the third question, part A. We have a dialysis tube, tubing, and it is an artificial membrane. Actually, this is a 
called as a like works like a partially permeable membrane, and it means that the partially permeable membranes of the PPMs they uh, have actually are selective or partially permeable to the nutrients. They allow some of the nutrients to pass through, and they do not. They stop some of the uh, molecules, like big molecules, and the others to pass through them. They are good in the dialysis machine to be used. And the people they have a kidney uh, disease or problem. Um, so there is a test being done here, as you can see by looking at this uh, diagram. There is a dialysis tube tubing here, and inside it they put some glucose solution, and outside it is just a pure water, uh, and there is no actually other is just a pure water molecules, and there's no actually other molecules in it, even no glucose in it. There is put a rubber band here to secure it, the tubing, and there is a knot there so there is no leakage outside. We make sure there is no uh, of the solutions leaking outside. Now you see the results of this is shown here. The students take the samples of the water outside the dialysis, dialysis tubing every five minutes to test the sample for any presence of the sugar. The area agent or that we use, use for uh, testing sugar is Benedict reagent or solution. That how do you do that? You just take a sample and then warm it, hit it in the water bath, and they add some, some uh, amount of Benedict solution or reagent to it, and wait for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then watch the color changes color of the magnetic solution, the reagent changes based on the concentration or amount of the sugar uh, level inside the solution. The higher usually the concentration, darker color we will have. And the color usually changes from uh, green to dark red. So dark red means it's very concentrated, so much sugar is inside the solution. Um, but the the, the, the green color means there is a small amount of the sh sugar in it, or means a very dilute sugar solution. And the blue color is the color of the reagent, magnetic reagent. If it stays the same blue color after the experiment, it means that there is no sugar present in it. So what here is happening, you look at the table, the data, after the zero time, which means that it stays blue. Of course, zero time is just at the start of the beginning of the experiment. So we'll just, why do we take the uh, measure, the, what would you actually we need to test it at the beginning, in the initial time, in the zero time, because we should make sure that there is no leakage of the sugar uh, from the dialysis tube. I mean, the setting up of the apparatus and everything is correct. There is no error, no mistake that we have done here. So we want to eliminate that error. So if anything happens, we can just, if there is a, at zero time, if there is a sugar there, it means I have done some mistake or the dialysis, the light dialysis tubing is not working, is broken somewhere. So we can fix the issues at the beginning of the experiment. So, so just to make sure, ensure that no glucose is in the water outside of the dialysis tubing to cause an error in the result. That's why we do test it at the in zero time. Then at the, after five minutes, we get the green color, then 10 minutes pass, then again yellow color, then the che we check it after 15 minutes and we say that it becomes, you see that the intervals are all equal. That's how we do that. Intervals are, should be all the same and equal. So blue is means no, nothing. Green means a slightly concentrated, a little bit dilute actual solution, a little bit of the water, a sugar solution, sugar molecules are gone inside it. And the yellow means a bit more, more than stronger than the green color. And the red means it's a highly concentrated sugar solution. It means that there are, more, there are lots of sugar molecules, glucose molecules that they have left the inner uh, in the inside of the uh, tubing through the partially permeable membrane, which is the dialysis tubing, and by diffusion, the more, uh, usually the more concentrated the uh, con the high, the more concentrated inside the sugar inside the dialysis tubing, the this diffusion will be faster because the diffusion means that the molecules of the 
uh, in the diffusion to these uh, sugar molecules. I usually diffuse from vertical or more to vertical or less. Is a down the concentration gradient. So the more concentrated, the faster these diffusions. So describe and explain results. I also did explain and I explain it again. So because it has three marks, so you have at least to mention three uh, important uh, points here. So you, first of all, you write about the blue color at the initial time was zero. It means no glucose present uh, to ensure that there is no glucose in the water outside to, um, to, have, to remove any errors at the beginning. And also, the, the thing is that another point that you can write is that the green, yellow, and red means that there is a glucose in the water, as glucose has diffused out of the dialysis tubing and down the concentration gradient from high to low. Through the partially permeable membrane here is the dialysis tubing, and it is because the dialysis tubing is permeable to glucose molecules, because glucose molecules are small, tiny. So these are the things that you can write. Another thing that you can write is that the green means less concentrated, yellow is more concentrated, and red is the most concentrated solution. Um, this is the results that I have gained. Yeah. So the second part of this question says, the student repeated the investigation with a higher concentration of the glucose in dialysis tubing, predict the results that the student will observe here. Yeah. Now, I. I'm, I'm sure I, I said that, I explained, the higher the concentration of the sugar inside the dialysis tubing, because there is more contrast, more uh, difference between the inside and the outside concentration. So is a, uh, dif the diffusion will happen faster. The, so the, uh, the, uh, the magnetic uh, solution changes colors quicker or the intensity of the color increases and you test it with the benetic solution or reagent. The next part of it, there is a diagram given to you and shows a part of the lining of the small intestine. And the lumen is a, a space inside the intestine where the food is digested. The lumen is the inside inner tube of the uh, small intestine. And this is one part of the lining of it, of the wall of the intestine. And you can see that there is, there are here, it is something like the finger like structures, those curves here, and it show they are labeled as A. Other structures that they have fold inside are called as C. And you should be familiar with this actually a simple diagram of the each organelle in the cell. This is one cell, and which is taken from the uh, lining of the uh, small intestine. Uh, B, there are, this is, of course, this is the nucleus. This is the DNA inside the nucleus. This is the nuclear, nuclear envelope or membrane. And these, what you see here, these folds are called as the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. But these ones that they are, have a pimple-like structures on them, the dark spots, these darker spots are ribosomes that are where the proteins are being synthesized by joining amino acids together. And the ones that they don't have these pimples, uh, they, they don't have this ability. So this part, which is uh, the surface, is looks like a bit rough because of these pimples. It's called as a rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the other part that doesn't have these ones is called as so, a smooth uh, endoplasmic reticulum. These are structures that they have a fold in size, and you see a lot of them there, they are mitochondrion or the mitochondria, plural. They are the very actually the energy is being produced, ATP is produced, or energy. It uh, makes energy, provides energy by aerobic respiration uh, for all cell processes, even like the uh, transport of the materials and the nutrients in and out. Um, and also, this part that you see, these, uh, pro, uh, these uh, finger-like structures in another surface of it, they are called as the microvilli. And these microvilli, they are to increase the surface area of these uh, inner uh, side of the uh, lumen of the small intestine. So once the surface area increases, it means we will have better absorption of the nutrients by diffusion and also faster absorption. And 
yeah, there are the things that you can write about this. I think whatever I you can message, it's not to this scale. So the question is was you have to explain each of these parts which is labeled. So I have already explained to you, state the names of the three label structures and describe the role of the each structure in the, small, in the uh, intestinal uh, cell. So uh, one more time, A is the microvilli. It uh, is increasing surface area for the absorption by diffusion. And B, if you want to write about B, you can write rough endoplasmic reticulum because it is pointing to that part that has this pimple-like structure, which is ribosome. And it is where the protein is being synthesized by assembling the amino acids in a specific sequences. And then uh, C is a mitochondrion, which is by aerobic respiration. It provides ATP or energy for all cell processes. Question, now, uh, the next uh, part, of this part C of this question is shows uh, another the diagram. Uh, in this diagram, is saying that the cholera bacterium uh, can survive in a small intestine and large intestine. Bacterium increases the toxin that interacts with the receptors of and the surface of the cells. And uh, this bacterium is entered into your gut, into your alimentary canal in the small intestine by taking in the polluted, contaminated food or water. So once it goes there, it releases a toxin that actually sends a signal to the receptors of the surface of the, uh, the cell surface in the lining of the small intestine. And it, you see that the, uh, this is diagram is showing the effect of the toxin. And also the arrows indicate the direction of the movement. This is very important too. What is these receptors are showing the toxins, and also this uh, triangle shape uh, structure is the uh, iron, and an iron which is moving out into the lumen. This is the lumen of the intestine, that inner tube. So these are on the these are the cells on the lining of the of the wall of the intestine. The toxin stimulates the secretion of the iron, which is shown as the X. We do not know what it is. You have to guess out of a small uh, in his own cell. So state the name of the ion X. Ion X is a chloride ion, Cl minus. Don't write chlorine. Chlorine is an element. Is ion form of the charge form of this element. It's called as chloride ion, um, which is um, because it has gained electrons, so it is charged already. And the next part is uh, you have to describe the effects on the body of the uh, secretion of the iron X into the lumen of the intestine. You can write the word the water is lost by osmosis down water potential gradient due to the area carrying, um, causing the dehydration and also other source and the ions also it is lost during this the area. When you have the area, you only is not water which is moving out of your body. And you're losing not only water, but also salts and ions and some minerals. So you have to, that's why when you have the area, you need to have some oral uh, rehydration uh, solution like the salt and some uh, mineral water. Question number four. Now, this question number four is about the plants and is more about the uh, sexual reproductions and wind pollination. Um, Johnson grass, or called as a subgum a halepin, and is wind pollinated. And it means that, wind pollinated means that this is the wind that takes the pollen grain from the anther of one flower or the same flower and put it on the uh, uh, stigma or the female part of the flower, or, which is maybe the same plant or the other plant. So this is called as pollination, and that is how the pollination is happening is happening by wind. So that is the wind that helps in pollination. I mean, it carries the pollen for, and from the uh, anther and put it on the stigma. And some of the flowers are insect pollinated. Uh, it means that that's the insect job. I mean, the insect 
uh, goes there and the pollen grains attached to the body or the fur or whatever, then it carries it to the uh, other, uh, put it on the femur part of the plant. So this is called insect pollinator. But this one, for that one, uh, the flower needs, if it is insect pollinated, the flower is usually the female part and the male part are hidden and are inside of the flower. You can't, you can't see that properly and are not so much visible. But what you, you see, you see a very colorful, uh, beautiful uh, flowers with the beautiful petals. And the petals are very uh, bright colors. They are usually uh, a variety of the colors, so attractive, so big. And the cover, actually, and they, uh, uh, they uh, surround or hide actually the female and the male part because yes, is that because they just need to attract the insects for to do the pollination. That's it. So that thing they are scented. They all have a very good. Uh, they are scented. I mean, it is scent. They have to have that smell, beautiful <laughs> smell, so they can attract again. Or they are. Uh, Oh, yeah, but they are having this kind of thing. So you, the, the most thing that you see is the very big petals, colorful, they are scented. Those ones are insect pollinated. What, what do you see here? We don't see any petals. It's a plant. And you see just the female and the male part are hanging out. It's like it's posed to the air. Why? Because uh, that is wind pollinated uh, plant flower. It means that the pollen grain needs to be carried by wind. So it should be exposed to the, it's not exposed to the wind, to the air, so it can easily be carried. And they are light, they are small. They can actually easily be carried by the wind. And the female part also is uh, hanging out. So it can easily capture the pollen grains that are in the wind. There's more chances of very successful fertilization. Um, so what I can say, when it says, uh, this is the features that you see. Now, I just move on into the question to show you to state the genus of the Johnson grass. So genus is the bino in a binomial system you are familiar with. This is a kind of binomial naming system. Uh, as you say, this is sorghum helipens. Sorghum helipens. Sorghum, the first initial uh, name, shows genus and usually the first initial letter of it is written in a bow or is in a uh, capital letter and the rest of it is just a uh, lower case and you see that is an italic form of writing is with a slant as you can see the other part the second part the second name is a species and so if they ask you what is the species name is the halopens but if it is asked for the genus name, you have to write sorghum. So here it is asking for the genus, so you can just write sorghum. And make sure you write it with the first letter capital and the rest with the small letters. The second part of it is that it's got the scalp two features visible again, and it shows that it has been pollinated, as I told you already. So what you have to write is that the feathery stigma where are the stigmas? There are the stigmas. I mean, the stigma is the female part, one part of the female part. And is where it needs to, is sticky, and it has a, like this glue lock, you know, uh, thing on it. So the pollen grain, it actually gets close to it and it is sits on it. It can't be easily taken away because it's sticky, it sticks there, it glues there. Uh, so that's the stigma, which is feathery also. Feathery and it is, it is feathery because it gives more larger surface area to it, so it can better capture the pollen grains that are floating into the air. And the other part, they are these ones that you see, are like two of them hanging from one, uh, actually, filament, on the one filament. So they are called as anthers, and these are stigmas. You look at them, both of them are hanging outside. So it means outside of the flower, it means that there is more chance of the capturing the pollen grain which is in the air. So the anther, for the anther, the bean can easily blow the pollen grain away from the plants. 
So it is exposed. This one is exposed to the air, so the pollen grains can be easily carried by the wind. Uh, for this, the stigma is, is actually stick out. This is uh, uh, um, actually uh, outside, so it's as easily can capture the any pollen grains which is inside the air. Those are the things that you can write. You can structure your own sentences, or you just not need to write sentence. You just mention uh, the words, which is the keywords. Like you can write feathery stigma, so largest surface area, and you can write stigma and anther hanging outside, so better to capture the pollen, the for example pollen grain, or can uh, easily pollen uh, pollen can be uh, taken away from the uh, anthers. So the next part of these questions, you can see the female part of the flower. This part is the stigma, this is a style, and this bovloid structure, this rounded part, uh, is called as the uh, ovary, the ovary of the flower. The ovary, later on, after fertilization, it grows, it has seeds inside, the bee seed, uh, later becomes seed, this is the ovule. Ovule, B is ovule, and later, or the female uh, cell, gamete, and later it grows into seed. And this part, the ovary, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and forms fruit. So the fruit is this ovary that you eat. But this style will become shorter and shorter and disappears, and a very small part of the stigma will be left later. Okay? So after fertilization. This you see, the very long tube here, this is pollen grain sitting on the stigma. So this is the pollen grain has made a pollen tube and, and sends its or genetic information uh, that the gametes, the male gametes actually is, is infusing, injecting it inside the uh, female gametes. This is the female gamete or, uh, or ovule. Ovule, not ovium. Ovium is in the animals, in the human. Uh, this is the egg cell which is for the uh, called as an ovule the female gamete here is called as a ovule in the plants and a is the male gamete that is now injected that you see uh, and there are once they fuse together they make uh, the, the, uh, the cell becomes uh, fertilized so the seed will be formed and the seed later grows and that's it so the C is ovary d is the uh, inside of the uh, is the ovule actually and the b one is the uh, female gamete e is a style is it just connects this the stigma to the ovary that's it now the question is that you have to name these uh, these labels the name of the labels c as i said is the ovary and or the wall of the ovary, and D is ovule, this is ovule, and E is a style that longer tube that connects the stigma, where the pollen grain is seed, and it is a sticky, it has that glue-like uh, liquid in it, and then this part is ovary. And the next part of it, you have to fill up the gaps, the blank parts in this, uh, sentences you have to complete them. Pollen grains are formed in anthers during this formation. The number of chromosomes in nuclei is halved by the process of so this is a process of the reduction division or meiosis. So you can write reduction this is reduction division or meiosis in it of this. This means the male nucleus A in pollen tube is described as a haploid nucleus. Haploid means that it has half of the chromosomes in it because the number of the chromosomes are reduced. When nucleus A with the nucleus B, of course, if it fuses, joins, or you can write combines, the chromosome number doubles to form, but it doubles now, it goes back into zygote, which is 
diploid to form a diploid nucleus. So from haploid to diploid after fertilization. The name of this process is fertilization. Then the zygote divides by the process of mitosis to form an embryo. So this process is mitosis. Now, the next part is asking, describe the advantages of several reproduction, sexual reproduction to a wild population of flowering plants such as Johnson grass. How actually it has, what are the advantages of it? So one of the things that we can write is that we can have a more diversity or more genetic variation because there are two parents. You have female and male. So the seeds are being formed. And another th explanation is that there are mutations that can take place because there are genes that are mixed from the different parents. So we have mixtures of the genes here and different combinations of the alias and the genes. So we have mutations also happening. So I also, we had, they are easy, easy, they can easily be adapted to the new environmental conditions and also the changes in the environment. They have this ability based on the changes in the environment. We will have the changes in the genes so they can be easily adapted to the, uh, it's quite beneficial to the plant. And also due to natural selections, and cross-pollination, the new species can be evolved by this kind of process, it's a sexual reproduction. And also the seeds can be dispersed or taken away from the parents, bovines, animals, anyway, just and resulted into colonizing the new areas, occupying new areas. And once they are carried away from the parents or where they are, colonizing the new areas, it helps uh, to have less competition. So it will be less competition between or among the parents and the offsprings because now there are more uh, area available, more land available, more foods, more nutrients, more light, access to the more uh, resources so they won't fight, they won't compete uh, for these things. And the seeds also stay dormant because we have seeds and these seeds that are formed are able to stay dormant. It means that stay silent, stay uh, on inactive in when the actually conditions of the environment are adverse or, uh, or harsh so they can survive and they can grow and germinate once they found the environmental conditions are in their favor of them. The next part is that they uh, asking us to write about the sexual reproductions uh, and say that uh, you know that this requires energy and you have to just say where actually this energy which is produced in the mitochondria, for example, is being used uh, by organisms in which, uh, how actually the organisms they use energy. In, what did, why do they need energy? So except that one which is mentioned in other than in reproduction, you have to mention some other uh, uses of the energy in the organisms. We can write that they need energy to synthesize or to make proteins. Uh, you can say that they need energy to transport nutrients in the phloem. Uh, and also you can see, say that um, they need it for doing cell divisions mitosis or meiosis, and also they needed to absorb ions from the soil by active transport. You know that the ions uh, absorption is by active transport, it's not simple diffusion or uh, osmosis. It needs energy. And also they needed to grow to repair the cells, the damaged cells, and also they need to uh, do some, uh, for example, because it's in the organisms generally, so if the organism can be uh, an animal. So if it's an animal or like a human being, it can be used for the muscle contractions. And also, this energy can be used for sensitivity. It means that to sense and detect changes that happens around the organism and to make a response accordingly. So, and also for the matter of survival, and to send nerve impulses in the animals. It's very important to detect 
and they send nerve impulses to make some reactions. You can write any of these answers. I simply say that to synthesize protein, transport nutrients in the phloem, doing cell division, absorb uh, ions from the soil by active transport, to grow and repair the cells, to do muscular contractions, to sense and detect changes around them, to send nerve impulses. You only need to, to choose any three of these uh, answers that I have given and just to write it there because it has three marks and I already put three actually lines for you. You want to trade it means that you have to mention only three. Question number five. The ciliates are classified in the kingdom protactus and the bacteria and the protactus are the same as uh, eukaryotes. Okay, so don't get confused. And bacteria are classified in the kingdom prokaryotes. So say two structural features that distinguish the cells of a protactase from a prokaryote. So you know that the, I just say about the protactase. So other than that, is, it, so it means that protactase have these things. What do they have? They have nucleus. They have a nuclear membrane and an envelope. They are having nuclear membrane and envelope. It means that uh, the uh, prokaryotes they don't have. Just, just don't write like this. Some of the students like this. The first line they write, for example, for example protoctase, they have a nucle nucleus. The, the, and the second one, they, they write uh, prokaryotes, they don't have nucleus. This is wrong. Once they have written, they're always talking about the differences. So the first line, if you say that the protoctase, they have a nucleus, it means that, of course, automatically, I know that the, you mean that the prokaryotes, they don't have. That's why you have mentioned that, isn't it? So do not, not, do not need to repeat that one and write that protoxid that the prokaryotes don't have it on the second line. This is wrong. You will lose mark. We will give you only one mark to this answer. So just if you write about protoxid, write about it. If you want to mention the structures that the prokaryotes have, so it means that the other one doesn't have because this is the differences. So you just keep writing about the prokaryotes. But don't write the same features and don't make a comparison and repeat it in a proposal for, for, uh, for talk this and for carriers in the two different as a two different points this is wrong so what i do in the first line i say pro talk is they have nucleus they have nuclear membrane or envelope around their dna we can add that uh, pro they don't have sorry the pro for carriers they don't have second one pro talk or the eukaryotes they have cell walls, if they have, like for example, plants, uh, which is different from the prokaryotes. For example, in the plant cells, they have cell walls, which is cellular cell wall, but in the prokaryotes is, uh, for example, in the bacterium, it is peptidoglycan. That the, the that, mole that type of the molecule which is being made above is peptidoglycan. So they have cell walls, but they are different from each other in the second line. Or you can say that, another option, protoctis or the eukaryotes, they have linear chromosomes. But in the prokaryotes, it is uh, usually circular. It means that it doesn't have two ends. But in the Protoctis, it has two ends, which is like a strand, like a structure. So this is for this part, and then we'll move on to the second part of it. And you see the different diagrams of the species of the ciliate that are found in the sewage treatment for, uh, works or facilities. So what you can see here is talking, uh, asking you to, uh, is it like a dichotomous key to identify the ciliates later in the next part of the question? This one. You have to fill up this one and to construct or to complete this uh, identification key or dichotomous key for to identify different species. It means that what should I write here? So if the answer is ye yes, so that shows that the organism is B, and if it is no, shows organism E. And this one is already done. And for the four, what should I write here? That if the answer to it the answer to this question is yes, shows uh, organism A, and if it is no, shows organism C. Let's go back to this. In this diagram, what I see is that didenium or organism B, ciliate B, 
is actually has something in common with the E vorticella. What are those common things? Is that ring of the ciliates that you can see here around it. How is it? The arbus of them have these two rings of the cilia at the ends, at one end. Okay? So at the end, they have rings of the cilia, one ring or two rings of the cilia. But the east ones, if you see that these two, uh, this one doesn't have, the, the cilia are quite different from these two because they are fused together. These are also, they are covering of the cilia they have. These two are much more closer to each other. They have a covering of the cilia here, and uh, what it is surrounding them is covering them, covering the whole cell. But this one has on one end. So I can put this one, B and E, into same category. So what can I, uh, because I want to distinguish between B and E, remember B is an oval shape, this one has, for example, a stem. This one doesn't have the all differences between them. For example, if I move on into the question, it says that start from here. First, has a ring of the cilia at the one end of the organism. If it has, it actually leads you to this direction. And if it doesn't have, you have to, you can lead you to define organism D and A. So B and A, both of them, they have cilia at one, uh, at one end of the organism. Isn't it? Look and see. B and E, they have one, it's both cilia at the one end, isn't it? A car, it? But these ones they don't have, okay? This kind of structure. So between B and E, how about question I can write here to show that the organism, if the answer is yes, shows organism B. If it is no, so it shows organism A. So you can write that in one of them, for example, they, they have two rings of the cilia. Organism B has two rings of the cilia. You see that? I'll move it up a bit. So you see two rings of the cilia, but this one is only one ring. So you can use this one. If it has two rings, so it is B. If it doesn't have two rings, it is E. So you're right here. It has, it has two rings of cilia. If it is yes, so it is B. If it is no, so it is E. So I already have answered this part. So I found it. It has two rings of the cilia. So how should I find, so for this one is completed, I move on into this. It has a store lock structure inside the organism. If the answer is yes, is D is already done. That's the only one that has a store like uh, structures inside its uh, actual cell. This one, these two don't have. So if the answer was no, now we do not know which one is A, which one is C. We want to write the question to define uh, the different organisms between A and C. So this one is already done. The answer is D for the star like a structure inside. So if the answer is no between A and C, what should I do now? What should I write in this box? That if the answer is yes, it leads me to organism A. If it is no, it leads me to C. Look at between the differences between A and C. What should I write? The answer is yes. It has a covering of the cilia. Or you can write it doesn't have, because the answer should be no, it doesn't have a cilia fused together, so you should see. Other, you write that one or this one. So what can I write? I write either it has a covering of the cilia, so the answer is yes, become organism A. If the answer is no, become organism C. Or you can write it doesn't have any fused cilia. If the answer is yes, it doesn't have, so it's organism A. If the answer is no, it has. No, it has. It has a fused cilia, so the answer is organism C. So, these are the how you answer the questions. I move on to the next part of the question, which is more about uh, sewage treatment, water treatment facilities, and using the biological treatment way. Uh, Didinium is a predatory ciliate. A video uh, car recording was made of one, but you don't have a video here. What you see is just a capture photo of the different uh, parts of this video. So you don't see any, anything, but you see some changes into this different part. So you see that uh, that this part is a paramecium. I mean, that is a, uh, that the DNM is this one, which is feeding on this. I mean, it's eating this one. Okay, it's eating paramecium. I remove it from the water facilities. Complete the table. You see by looking at this photo, what kind of 
characteristic of the life can be seen. You know that the living organisms, they do these things. They move, they feed, they grow, they reproduce, they respire, they excrete. So the other life actually processes that they can uh, are so, uh, characteristics of the living organisms. They do these things. But what kind? What what of these uh, characteristics of the life? You can see in this photo. It's a capture photo. What does it show you? Does it show excretion? No, I don't see any excretion. Excretion means to get rid of the waste products of the metabolism. It can be by sweating in the animals. It can be by uh, urination. It can be by uh, just diffusion of the you know, carbon dioxide gas from the lungs or from the skin or from the, and it's, it's like single cell like this one, it's through the cell membrane, or it can be a waste product. So this is called as excretion. It doesn't show that? No, I don't see any sign of it in today's picture. So this is, I put a cross here, or growth, or you just don't read anything because it's just put tick in front of those one answer. Let's just leave it empty. Growth, is the cell growing? It doesn't get grow, just the thing is going inside. So that's why it gets a bit bigger in size, but it's temporarily. Once it is digested, it goes back to the previous shape. So it's not, growth means to the number, the mass actually should be increased or the number of the cell increases. So how it gets bigger? By this one, no, I don't see any signs of that. Movement, is it moving? Yes, it's moving in changing this position over time into the water moves from here, yeah, that's you see, the direction, the orientation of the head, everything is changing, changing position. So that's movement, I put a tick in front of it. Nutrition, is it feeding? Is it taking in food? Yes, it's eating, it's already also mentioned here, it's feeding. So I put a tick in front of nutrition. Is it a production? Is it a producing? Is in, is mean that making offspring? Is means that to produce, to produce the similar uh, uh, cells, no white division or anything. Is it is it is that happening here? No, I don't see. It's only one cell, one cell. Uh, so no respiration. Is it respiring? I don't respire. It happens inside the mitochondria. Is it uh, by using the oxygen and mixing it with the food? Uh, it breaks down into uh, uh, ATP, which is energy, and also produces carbon dioxide and water. Is it what you see here? This is the meaning of respiration. Do you see that? No, I don't see anything, any respiration happening here. So this is not the answer. The next part is a food actually web. And the different chains joined together link to make a food web of real microorganisms in the sewage facilities, treatment facilities. And the question is that, uh, first of all, I just look at it. If, if these arrows direction shows uh, this one is eaten by this one, is the food of the, this one. So they are in the uh, lower part of these uh, actually energy level. Uh, these are in the first, every day, the arrows starts from the producer, the, the primary producer, and ends the uh, last consumer. And the high one. That's why the direction should be like that. What is eaten by what? It means that this decomposer bacteria, the bacteria is being eaten by nematodes. It's a kind of worms. Or it also can be eaten by Worticella. Or also can be eaten by Paramecium. So this is the thing. Everything is starts with this one chain. But this is one chain, it's very short. And this is one chain, bacteria taken up by the paramecium. Is it another chain? Is taken by Vorticella. Now, we have another chain starting from here. So this is the primary producer, photosynthetic bacteria. So the bacteria here is eaten by Vorticella. And also can be eaten by paramecium to start another chain and also can be eaten by uh, rotifers. So this is the food for these things. So they are, they are called as primary um, consumers. So rotifers, paramecium, water, so they are primary consumers for photosynthetic bacteria. And for decomposed bacteria, nematodes, paramecium, water, so are primary consumers. We have another one. Didinium. Didinium actually is a secondary consumer for this chain, 
photosynthetic bacteria is taken up by the paramecium, it eats it. So then paramecium is eaten by the DNA. So it becomes secondary consumer and this chain. This is the first consumer, this is the second consumer. And the chain ends here. Another chain we have here, we have the composer of bacteria and it's taken up by the paramecium and the paramecium eaten by the DNA. So here, paramecium is the secondary consumer of this, uh, sorry, this is the, yeah, sorry, the DNM is the secondary consumer of the decomposer bacteria, uh, the DNA. So this is the primary, this is secondary to this one. So we have another chain here. So we have one chain here, very short, another chain here. Bacteria is taken by nematodes and the chain ends here. Another chain, we have bacteria taken up by the paramecium and then eaten by the DNA, the chain ends here. And then another chain is very short, bacteria taken by Vorticella, the chain ends here. And another uh, chain, again, we have the other side. It starts from the bacteria, which is photosynthetic bacteria is the, again, primary producer. And it's now one chain, a very short chain it makes, which is eaten by the Vorticella. The chain stops here. And then again, photosynthetic bacteria is taken by paramecium and then taken up by the didinium. So this chain is a bit longer, but ends in there. And then we got the photosynthetic bacteria in another chain, which is taken by the rotifers. Okay, so this is another shorter chain. So now I'm going to answer this question. Construct one food chain with three trophic levels that use energy derived from the breakdown of the sewage. Do not draw the organism. Okay, one food chain, I already told you. You can construct this one. Bacteria. Bacteria is taken by the paramecium and then taken by the dinium. So how do, you, how do you write it? You first put the bacteria, then the same direction of the arrow connected to the paramecium, and then the same arrow direction connect to DNA. The second part of it says that the water that passed out uh, of the sewage works was often cloudy with the suspended matter. Scientists discovered that the ciliates reduced the cloudiness of the water during sewage treatment and the, sewage, and the suggest how the ciliates reduced the cloudiness of the water using the information which is given. So what, what you have seen in the picture, or what is told you, is that the bacteria is actually uh, eaten by the ciliate. So the ciliate, they eat bacteria and the pathogens in the sewage. And also, the, uh, the any dead materials there also been consumed by them. So they stop uh, spreading of the disease by cleaning it, cleaning the water supply or water body by just this action by eating the any kind of the dead material and also by eating bacterial pathogen inside the sewage that's how they stop and how to make the uh, cloudiness of the water less the next one says explain how sewage treatment reduces the spread of the disease so how it is this day because it is it's eating the bacteria, which causing the sickness and also pathogens uh, that, are, that are inside the water. They eat them, and any kind of harmful bacteria are taken up by them. So they stop the spreading of the pathogens that are in the water by eating them. And together with using the chlorination and the using chemical treatments also, any kind of other treatments, we can uh, stop the spreading of the waterborne disease. Like, for example, in the, like a bacteria called, which is causing cholera. So it's a cholera caused by the bacterium. Um, if it is in the water, it can be taken up, it can be eaten by ciliated uh, cells so, and destroyed. So make the, actually, this uh, causing the, stopping the spreading of this disease uh, longer. The next part, explain. Uh, explain how actually uh, sewage, I think I just explain how the sewage treatment reduces the spread of the disease. I'll also explain this one. Now I'll move to, uh, to the next part. You need to explain uh, the, uh, that the importance of the nitrifying bacteria in the nitrogen cycle. In the nitrogen cycle, you have to refer to the diagram again that I have already shared with you. Uh, it converts ammonia to nitrous ion and uh, 
also make nitrates available to the plants, then it is the nitrates is taken up by the plant roots to be used to make amino acids and also protein. So this is how the water, uh, actually the nitrifying bacteria, uh, works in the nitrogen cycle and why it is very important because they actually convert, they make nitrates or convert uh, by converting the ammonia or ammonium ions to the nitrate ions, they make it available to the plants into the soil, and then from the soil they are taken by the plant roots and by the plant, and then they are being used to make uh, amino acids that are necessary for uh, synthesis of the proteins later. So that's why it make it make them very important in this nitrogen cycle. Well, we have another question also here. So this question is about is it the genetics. Um, the first part of this question before I read anything about AIDS is that it's a predictive diagram, but later, because the first question is to define only the term inheritance. So you just simply can say that it has transmission of the genetic information from generation to generation. So, but the next part of it, you need to come up with you using the symbol B and the capital B and a small b, just to use the status genotypes of the individual five and eight in a particular diagram, five and eight, these ones, we need to know what A, that what actually the uh, genotypes are, not phenotypes, we are talking about the genotypes, I mean, the genetic uh, actually arrangement, how is it, we have to find it, it's between five, before the five and eight, both of them are males. So, first of all, I just want to go through the diagram and show you what actually they mean. This is a particular diagram. Uh, it's talking about the color blindness, which is a trait that it is inherited. When you are, when it, it says that it's an inherited disease or characteristic or whatever, what you have to do is that you should use X and Y as a, you know, that the sex chromosomes are here involved. It means that it's very important if you are male or female in this kind of thing. So you just don't simply use uh, those uh, alleles like B, B capital and B uh, small just to define the, uh, uh, the normal allele and the other one dominant and recessive. You need to also use, link these two to the sex chromosomes as X and Y. You know that the sex chromosomes, yeah, like I want to talk about it, but first I just go through this particular diagram that this, Actually, these uh, squares are showing, if it is white, is it showing the male, both of the squares. If it is a square, are showing it is a male. The circles are showing it is a female. But if they, if they are white color, it means that they are normal, they don't have any disease. But if it is dark color, like this one, so it means that they have a disease, which is the color blindness here. So, now I want to just show this one to you, I'll stop sharing this and share another document with you to uh, find, uh, to step by step guide you how to find the genotypes of this. Okay, I have already prepared these things for you, information. So we have sex chromosomes. If you are male, uh, all your cells, the 23rd actually uh, uh, chromosomes, uh, the, the chromosome of the 23rd chromosome in your cell, uh, after they will have X, Y, it will be X, Y, one X, one Y. So while it is, uh, if all your cells, if you are female, they will, the 23rd chromosome will be X and X. So it shows that you are female, okay? So two X's you have if you are female in each cell. If you are male, you will have X and Y. When they say it is sex-linked uh, disease, it means that the uh, alleles usually are carried by the X uh, chromosome, not the Y chromosome. So the female can have, on the both X, can have any kind of alleles here. But the y, y chromosome doesn't carry, but it can appear on the X chromosome. And then they said you show B and B, capital and a small, to show the dominant 
allele, which shows the dominant here is healthy person, normal person, who doesn't have any disease. And we use this small one to show the recessive allele, which is called blindness okay, allele. How do I show it? If you are a male, you should show it by this one, X and Y chromosome, this one. Show that it's a male. So you have two options, two possibilities here, yeah, two, two possibilities here. Yeah. If X, because X is carrying the allele, either it carries B capital, it carries B small, which is recessive, this is dominant. Because there is only one X, whatever allele is in it, it expresses itself in the, that person. It means that if it is carrying B capital, which is showing the allele, which is a healthy allele, healthy gene, it means that that person would be a healthy male, a male which is healthy. But if it is B uh, small, which is a recessive one, and is a sick actually is allele or the gene, so it means that that person is a male because it is XY, and it is sick, it is colorblind, because it has that recessive allele. That's it. So this is a sick, colorblind, sick. This is normal. Normal male, sick male. Then, for this one, if you are a female, there are these kind of options or this combination of the alleles. Either both of them are dominant. So the person, because they... Both of them are dominant. Both of them they express themselves. So it would be a female, which is healthy, normal. So a female is normal here. And I put N. If, if one is capital, which is dominant, the other one is recessive. Always the, the dominant, which is more powerful than this one, expresses itself. So this person is, shows normal. It has no sickness, no color blindness. But what is happening is a carrier. I mean, it's carrying the, the gene which is actually not normal. It's carrying the gene of the color blindness. It means that the person is normal, but carrying the genes and then can't pass it to the next generation, to the babies. This person is a female again, but it is not normal. It is color blind because both of them are recessive and sick alleles. So it means that the person is not normal, and it is, I just write sick, it's not a sickness, but I just write sick to make it easier for us. So it is sick female. Now look at this one. Which one I have to put here? I have to choose. This is a male, so definitely I have to choose any of them. Either this one or this one. This person, this male, is healthy. So I cannot use this one, this combination of the allele and the genes. So I can use this one only. So I should place this one in the box there. Definitely the person has this actually uh, genotype because it is healthy and is a male. How about this one? Number two is a female. So I should choose any of these three. Which one I have to choose? She is healthy. Is no, there is no color blindness a problem with it. So it's a normal person, normal female. This is normal, and this is also normal. Which one I have to choose? If I choose this one, if I put that one there, I just take it, I put it there, okay? I put it here. That's what happens. I put this one here. So there won't be any often carrier. It means that I, I should expect that all the other offsprings should like maybe be healthy. I, or I can actually be actually, but because that person also is healthy, is a healthy female, so um, it can be any of them actually. Either it can be this one, other. because you see that the children are healthy, they are healthy here, so it can be either this one, but if this is the case, if both of them are healthy, then if the next generation perhaps uh, it can't be. There should be mutation maybe happen here in, in one of them. Because the persons are healthy then, because all of them are carrying the healthy genes. There is not an unhealthy gene here, no colon blindness gene. So maybe here, this generation, uh, a mutation has happened. But 
So if I choose this one, it means that I shouldn't see color and blindness in any of them. Otherwise, maybe somewhere in these generations, one of them, there is a mutation happening. Or maybe one of them is a gamete being donated to them, gamete donation. So I don't choose this one or remove it because that's not the result. I cannot say that there is a mutation happening there. There is a, there is a color blindness issue here at the next generation, so there should be one of them carrier. And this one should be carrier, so it can be passed. The gene uh, can be passed to the next ones. So I use. They cannot use this one too, because if I use this one, uh, definitely uh, this, there should be. There should be one. Uh, this uh, boy should be actually colorblind. The more colorblind we have, even uh, definitely it will be not that one. So I can't choose that one. I choose this one, which is a heterozygous. That means the alias are not the same. So I use the heterozygous one I choose. So if I choose this one, the combination will be either XB and XB, which is this person become carrier, then okay, it should be actually, this one should be carrier, it should be heterozygous. Otherwise, there is no relevance. If you're at this one, number four, because it's healthy, I this should have this kind of uh, genotype. And the genotype should be this one because it cannot be this one because it is unhealthy. It is colorblind. So I use this one. I know that these, the genetic, uh, the genotype of this one should be this because it's a male and it's healthy. So in order to have this result, which are two males with the colorblindness, this one should be heterozygous again, heterozygous female. So I use this one here. Yeah. Now you see the gene combinations here. Uh, so I, based on this information, I expect this one to be X and Y because these male, these males, they are colorblind, so they should be their genotype. This one, and also the other one too. So I have two uh, similar genotypes here for the males. It can't be this one, of course, again. So for the females, for the females, Oh, I forgot to put uh, this one. This one is healthy, so it should be definitely similar to this. This is the genotype of this one, this male. But how about this one? She is healthy, but so in order to be healthy, it can be this combination because one X comes from the male, one X comes from the female. So it becomes XX and the B books uh, uh, homozygous. It means that the B capital. So this would be the uh, genotype of this female. We have this combination. So these are the answers. Now, now if I want to answer, we say that because it is a sex link. A trait, so it has carried by the genes, and if a male is normal, should be X, uh, should be uh, X B capital and Y. So if the male is color colorblind, should have the uh, this one, this trait. So X uh, B as well and Y, and then for a female, if it's normal, can be either a carrier like this one, or just normal like this one. And as there is colorblindness in the offsprings, so one parent has to be carrying the B allele, small allele, or the one which is carrying the uh, this one, recessive allele. So the mom should be this one, a heterozygote, uh, actually, allele it has. This one should be there for the mom. So for answering, so I already have answered. So the question in here, the second part is already answered. This one for the five, what is five and what is eight. Now we go to the next part of it and it says that individual three is a carrier of the color blindness because she has one copy of the allele for color blindness but has no more color vision. Describe the evidence for the, from the, the figure that shows that the individual three is a carrier. So we said that it is a sex link trait. So she is heterozygous to the gene, which is a B capital, B a small. So it means one uh, dominant, the other one recessive. And she is also carrying XX uh, chromosomes. 
because she's a female, of course, and her, uh, you know, the, the, the B capital is dominant, so she is only carrier, but looks normal. So the, she doesn't have a color blindness, but she can pass the recessive allele to her sons, which are five and seven, if you look at the diagram, because the father is the X and Y, so this one. So you can she can pass it off to the five and seven because she is carrier. And the other, and the other part of the, so I already have answered this part, and for the other part of the question, there, are, there was no history of the colon blindness. The parents and grandparents of the individual one and two, so just how color blindness first occurred in the family in the figure six one. So if there is no history of that, as I said, there should be mutation happening, the changes in the alias and the genes by any kind of the uh, incident. But, and also can be by because maybe a gamete is being donated somewhere. One of them, yeah, this can be one of the answer, possible answers. The, that's the end of the paper. Um, thank you for your attention and thank you for uh, participating in this session and I hope you like my videos if you really like it and want me to make more videos like this and also subscribe to my channel too. Thank you very much. Stay safe and healthy. See you again.